This panel, frankly, is, uh, is very important to, uh, to Army Cyber. I think it's important to uh, industry. I really look forward to uh, spending the entire day with you. If you look at the, uh, the lineup, I think the topics are very critical. Uh, the panelists are subject matter experts, and I think that, uh, uh, as uh, General Carter said, if, 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 we, uh, if we have the ability to uh, uh, engage in uh, very robust question and answers uh, throughout the day, it's really going to, uh, to drive uh, the uh, success of uh, today's operation. Hey, look, I've got a short period of time. I'm going to try to cover a lot of information. And uh, I only have two charts that uh, I think uh, you'll appreciate. But if we can put the, uh, the first chart up, and it's the, uh, the Army Cyber Mission. And I think that's uh, critically important for us. So I'll give you a second to read that. So three critical tasks. One that normally gets the most attention, that's cyberspace operations, that's both defensive, that's offensive, that's operate and defend the network. But it's bookended by two other critical missions, electronic warfare and information operations. As I've told several audiences recently, if you go back in time, I think cyber was probably the appropriate name for the command. As we look toward the future, it may not be appropriate. Because if we're not careful, we will concentrate on one of the tasks. And I think that is extraordinarily short-sighted and potentially dangerous. As we look at the information environment, that's what I'm interested in, and cyber is a piece of that. So in the future, maybe U.S. Cyber Command is no longer U.S. Cyber Command. It becomes U.S. Information Warfare Operations Command or U.S. Information Dominance Command. I'm not sure what the term will be, but what I will tell you is we've got to be careful about boxing ourselves in by the term cyber. And this environment is populated by multiple tribes. And if we're not careful, we are getting into this uh, discussion, which I don't think is useful, of uh, which tribe is included or excluded. And I'm at the point now where uh, I feel almost compelled to have to march through every single tribe because if I Despite the focus of what I'm going to talk about on any given topic, uh, if, I, uh, if I don't mention every tribe, uh, then what ends up happening is you don't care about that, uh, they're not important, we're not doing that, and what I would assure you, that's, uh, that's far from the, uh, the truth. And if anyone's looked at my schedule, or if you sat in the, uh, the meetings that we have on a daily basis as we're conducting operations, uh, electronic warfare, uh, cyberspace operations, information operations, all get their, uh, their equal due. Um, and what's also important is this is not just about us, it's also about the adversary. I have to be able to provide my commanders freedom of movement in this domain. I have to be able to use the entire operational depth of this domain, but I have to deny the adversary the ability to use the, uh, the domain. And some of our adversaries, they're becoming increasingly dependent in a way that we are because they've got to have access to space. They have to ac have access to ISR because that's what allows them to tune their long-range precision fires, tune their influence and information campaigns to plan their electronic warfare operations and execute them. And so our near-peer and peer competitors, we're all operating in this space. And we're operating in a very congested space because we have the commercial sector that can be uh, impacted by our operations. Take a look at what's happened with Facebook. Uh, if you want to see uh, pressure that can be put on a, a multinational company, if you want to look at the ability to use the spectrum, it has significant effort. So if you're employing GPS jammers, as many of our adversaries do, you're not just affecting military operations, you're affecting uh, commercial airlines, 
uh, you're uh, affecting uh, a lot of what, frankly, society has come to, uh, to rely on. So this is very, very important for, uh, for obvious reasons. Let's move to the next slide. So these are the priorities we're operating with. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is really important. As I told General Ham uh, as we chatted right before the presentation this morning, I'm going to assemble all the senior leaders uh, across Army Cyber and across actually the multiple tribes uh, for uh, about four days next week. And we're going to have a series of home on homes that will bring in the intel communities, the electronic warfare communities, information operations communities, signal communities, and certainly the cyber communities. I think I've got everybody, so if I admit it to you, uh, it's, it's an omission, uh, not, uh, you're not being ostracized. But we're going to bring all them together, and we're going to work through these priorities. So what I would say, these are my draft priorities as I've taken that first 60 days of, uh, of command look. And as I go into that conference next week, uh, we're going to lay out a draft vision, we're going to lay out these draft priorities, and we're going to review the mission statement also. And then what I hope four days later is to come out with uh, exactly uh, uh, what we're going to require as we move forward uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And so that's, uh, that's vitally important. So operate and defend the network. It is our primary weapon system for US DOD and certainly the Army. Without that weapon system functioning uh, the way it's designed, we don't have effective mission command. I don't have persistent ISR. I don't have long-range precision fires. All those other capabilities that we require as a modern military to dominate the battle space. And so that's vitally important, is getting job one done. Because what I want to be able to provide is our commanders the ability to see themselves and see the adversary. And I want them to be able to see that in real time. And we go back into this idea, which I think is the big idea, that speed is important, that our commander's ability to sense, understand, decide, and act faster than the adversary provides decisive advantage. So whoever can do that faster and with more precision, they enjoy decisive advantage on the modern battlefield. And it's not just in cyberspace. It's the ability to have sensor-to-shooter links. I have to be able to find, I have to be able to fix you and finish you faster than you can do the same to me. And that's across all domains, certainly not just the cyber domain. I've got to be able to deliver effects against our adversaries, not just in cyberspace, and so I think that's one of the modifications we'll make. I have to be able to affect them throughout the entire information environment, and that is absolutely critical to our success. Now, how do we do that? We do that by designing and building integrated capabilities. So there's some criticism of how we've combined, we've integrated Intel, and electronic warfare capabilities. And I'll take that criticism all the way to the bank. And we're going to continue to evolve. If we don't get it right on the first turn, then we'll make the changes that are required. But it's going to be informed by current operations. And that is one of the things I'll tell you. Your Army cyber soldiers, your Army electronic warfare soldiers, your Army intel soldiers, signal soldiers, they're in the fight every single day. And we're getting multiple, multiple reps. And that is allowing us to accelerate our understanding of the complexity of these operations, the importance of synchronizing all these information-related capabilities. So it's not just about cyber. It's much more than that. And I've got to have the capabilities. And that's where my partners in, in industry, in academia, our foreign partners, our joint partners are very important. Because I don't want to pay for something twice Getting back to speed, I don't want to deliver a capability late to need. So if you have it and I can use it, I can borrow it, uh, I can buy it, or you can use it on my behalf, I'm your partner. And so that's, that's absolutely essential to our success. This is all about, ultimately, increasing lethality for our commanders. 
So whatever the most capable system or most capable technique, tactic, or procedure is, that's what we're going to employ. And it doesn't necessarily have to be cyber v. cyber. So a lot of times when uh, there is a, uh, the breathless reporting of a cyber attack against our forces, against uh, the commercial sector, uh, the question is, well, what's your cyber response? Maybe the cyber response is not the response that's most effective in those circumstances. Maybe it is. But I want to look at the full range, just like our decision makers want to have options. We want to present multiple dilemmas to the adversary. So if we get into a cyber v. cyber only, that's not very useful. It doesn't provide us the flexibility I think our commanders demand and require. And readiness is uh, critically important to the cyber force, the electronic warfare force, the signal force, like our maneuver forces. Because they can't operate without us. Again, the foundational weapon system is our network, our data, and our weapon systems. Now, technology is important. Matter of fact, technology is critical, but what underpins all of this is our workforce. And we're going to spend time today talking about how we recruit, how we train, and how we retain that world-class workforce. And again, that's going to be a combination. It's going to require contractors. It's going to require government civilians. It's going to require uniform military. It's going to require partnerships. Because I can't grow, don't want to grow, don't think I have to grow every single capability organically in the military. And what we've learned over the last two years in particular as we've conducted operations at a very high tempo has given us enough information, frankly, to understand what we got right when we started this eight years ago, what we need to change. So remember, Cyber Command is about eight years old, Army Cyber is about eight years old, and we started with a roadmap. And guess what? We didn't get it exactly right. I don't know if you're as shocked as I am, but we did not get it exactly right. And we've made some evolution, but what I'll tell you is, as we have operated, we've accelerated our understanding and our learning, we're actually evolving faster. And that's critically important. So this idea of build, assess, build is even more important today. And that world-class workforce is what allows us to do that. And if you go up to the Defense Digital Service, I spent a couple hours with them on Monday, and you can see the world-class talent from across the United States. So military, in with people from the commercial sector who just want to contribute to their nation, to contractors, to government civilians, all tackling very tough problems. That's the recipe for success. Now, the question is, can we scale it adequately to meet the requirements, the demands that are placed on us in this domain? And then the last thing is to be successful, we have to be able to strengthen our partnerships. And that's across all those communities I just described. So there are a couple, there's a lot that I don't know. There are a couple of things that, uh, that I knew, do know. One is that in order to be successful, we're going to have to build this coalition of the willing, and it's out of absolute necessity. We're under persistent attack from increasingly capable and aggressive adversaries. And I can't do this alone. I don't want to do it alone. And it's not just about cyber. It is not just about cyber, let me repeat that. And I think as we sit down and we go over our vision for 2025 or 2028, that in three years or four years or five years from now, we will no longer be called Army Cyber Command. 
We're going to be Army information warfare operations or information dominance operations. We're going to be something else that's actually going to reflect the totality of the capabilities, the challenges, the opportunities of operating in this environment. So, sir, I'll stop there. And uh, to keep us on time, if there's any questions, I'm not sure if we have the time for that. I'm happy to take them. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm not going to answer that one. Not. <laughs> okay, so uh, have we properly defined cyber? Uh, the Intel comments uh, seem to indicate some degree of frustration with, uh, with current, or the initial comments seem to, uh, I think we've, I think we've uh, defined cyber, but we've defined it uh, actually so finely that, uh, and we've had our head down kind of working that tough problem. And that was probably out of necessity at the beginning. I'm tr trust me, I'm, I'm not going to fault uh, uh, General Alexander. He had a big idea. He uh, embarked on it. But I think what we've found is uh, we're going to have to broaden the aperture. So cyber, the definition for cyber itself may not change. But I think what's going to change is this idea that it's not just about cyber. Uh, that's going to take that entire tribe. When, when I look at the, uh, my most important you know, mission partners, first of all, it's the CIO G6. He, he is my ranger buddy uh, in, this, in this environment. So I, I literally uh, don't do anything unless I turn to General Crawford and talk to him about the impact on operations. Because what the Signal Corps is doing is, in my opinion, they're executing daily the most complex, most important operation that DOD and certainly the Army performs. And the dependency on their backs, and thankfully they have very strong backs, is, uh, is actually uh, pretty awesome. So, uh, but there's, there are a lot of challenges. And we'll talk about some of those as we go on. G2, very important partner. The commander of Cyber Command, the director of NSA, very important. When I was the chief of staff at uh, Cybercom, uh, what I would tell uh, every visitor is my most important partner is NSA, bar none. Because they allowed me to create that understanding through their sensor network. Now, when I look at my partners in the Army, CIO G6, G2, it's my EWOs that are, uh, that are out at every level. Why? Because they're sensing, they understand the spectrum that we operate many of our cyber systems, many of our weapon systems uh, transit. Cyber Center of Excellence, the Intelligence Center of Excellence, the Mission Command Center of Excellence, INSCOM, very important, NETCOM, which is not only a partner, but it's a subordinate unit. The acquisition community, Army Cyber Institute, Defense Digital Service, and the list goes on and on, my foreign partners. Particularly as we've operated, particularly in the CENTCOM area of operations, our foreign partnerships. And as I look to Europe, I look to the Pacific, our foreign partnerships become even more important. Because they're living in the spectrum, they understand the spectrum, they understand the environment uh, in their areas. How is the Army addressing uh, cybersecurity coalition networks? Uh, within which they operate or lead, or common standardized technical requirements being blank with coalition partners so that their network capabilities, development, acquisition activities are such that they can join the U.S.-led Army network deployed on operations in the future. So what I'll tell you is we're operating today uh, in, the real, in the real operational area uh, with our coalition partners on coalition networks. And I'll turn to my CIOG6 partner, I think he'll nod and say, that's very, very challenging uh, uh, for, obvious, for obvious reasons. And so what I will tell you is we've got to work very hard to keep those networks uh, defended. Uh, again, that's, that's a, a partnership that occurs. If it's a network that we provision, then uh, we'll have the lead on defense of those networks. Uh, but what I will tell you is We've got a long ways to go. And it's not just the defense of the networks. 
is making the networks usable through uh, the ability to share intelligence and uh, operational information at a releasable level. And I'll tell you, if you go down, we were just at, uh, we actually did, uh, were just out at, uh, uh, in the CENTCOM area of operations uh, over the last weekend, and we're talking to people that are operating on coalition networks. Uh, they're very happy to be on the network. Uh, what uh, they would be happier at is if we could uh, release information much faster uh, that uh, we, we start with uh, uh, no foreign, and the tendency should be, it's really interesting, when you go on the uh, CENTCOM networks, uh, if you're going to make something no foreign, you have to work really hard at it because the, uh, the pop-ups just torture you. So no, no foreign is about the last in the list of uh, options to classify something. If you scratch no foreign, it's going to ask you a couple of times. Are you sure you want to deny your partners access to this information? So they make it very, very hard. Uh, so that's just a first step. It's not just symbolic, though, because I was working my way through the network. There are a couple of things where, oops, they look through. It's not no foreign. Let me, let me go to uh, Terrell. Very good, uh, very good question. And uh, of all the tribes you mentioned, are you considering integrating uh, Army Space Forces into your command? Uh, I have not put my sights uh, on Army Space. Uh, I've, I already have enough fights uh, on my hands. And uh, so instead of being uh, a 360-degree fight, uh, I've kind of uh, aligned it. What, what I will tell you is it's really not a fight at this point. We started this discussion about four years ago. And I'll tell you, the people who operate, for instance, in the spectrum, intelligence collectors, our great signal core, and our electronic warfare core, they understand they've got to coexist within the spectrum. And it does no one an advantage if the EWO just increases power and he knocks the collectors and the mission command uh, off, the, uh, off the network. And we want the information that they're out there collecting. So they're sensing as they're traveling throughout the battlefield. And so I want to do this in a very smart way. And I think we do better than kind of Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint in the, in the talk, you know, 30 minutes before an operation. And what we're seeing as we're increasing uh, really the competitiveness of the environment out at our training centers that our commanders are really starting to understand this. So it's this idea that I've got to be able to see the adversary. I think the Intel guys do a pretty good job at that. I think that uh, they're enabled by uh, uh, our EWOs that are out there. And we're going to get more and more capabilities that we're going to field. And we're, we're, you know, the Secretary of the Army just signed the R-Struck last month. We're going to increase uh, the capability for planning and integration for both cyber and electromagnetic uh, activities at BCT Division Core and ASCC. And the kit is going to, uh, to follow. And we're going to have a lot of collection capability that's out there that's going to be manned by our electronic warfare force. And when I look at mission command, what I don't want to do is jam our fire support links if at that phase of the operation that's what we're dependent upon. But our commanders need to understand against a modern adversary, you can't take your Q36 or Q37 and stick it on the, uh, uh, the military crest of the hill and uh, go high power, you know, 360 degree operations, you know, for days at a time. If that asset is important to you and you operate like that, you're going to lose it in a heartbeat. Against adversaries that have the ability to collect, to process, analyze, very quickly and then be able to pass that to a long-range precision shooter. And we're seeing adversaries out there that have those capabilities. So we have to operate in this environment, the information environment within the cyber domain, full spectrum from very low end all the way up to, uh, to high end. 